getting up bright and early on Sunday morning. This is a bonus presentation that was unplanned uh, before the event, but during the event we definitely very quickly considered it and decided it was a good idea. So I will be happy to introduce in just a second uh, Jolly, who is a now three-year photographer for the event and by far the most fascinating photographer we've ever had at the event, as if we've had a million, but it truly a unique person is going to be speaking next. Um, everybody who meets him at the event, um, hundreds of people now, speakers and attendees and staff alike are always just seriously intrigued with Jolly. Um, the guy just comes as a photographer, but he has so much more going on behind the scenes. Um, and when you talk to him, that's very apparent. And with that said, today he'll be discussing a very specific topic, intermittent fasting, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so I'm not mistaken. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, he's going to tell you. It's going to be a great speech, nice little bonus, and I appreciate you guys, com you guys coming out. So, here's Jolly. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm Jolly. And most of you may know me as simply a photographer. A lot of you out there who've seen me have seen me around at the conference scene. Last year, I went to no fewer than 26 conferences. Usually I'm pretty easy to recognize. I'm lugging around a big camera. I've got the turban, usually crazy vibrant five finger shoes. But the thing is, I do a lot more than just photography. You see, and this may be a surprise to some of you, but I'm a hacker. I mean that in every sense of the word. I don't mean that just in the sense of me being a computer hacker, although I am that too. When I say I'm a hacker, I mean I hack everything. I'm a computer hacker, that's my day job. I'm a computer security expert. I'm a biohacker. I sit there and understand biochemistry, understand neurochemistry, understand how it all ends up coming and playing together. I'm a sleep hacker, frankly, because I want to optimize everything. So when I'm looking to sleep, I'm trying to figure out exactly that. How do I get the most results with the least amount of effort possible. I'm a travel hacker. I'm a nomad. I've been homeless for the last six months. Now, don't feel sorry for me. When I say I'm homeless, I mean good homeless. I'm the sort of homeless that jumps on a plane every couple of days and decides, hey, it's Tuesday. What city do I want to be in? I'm a finance hacker. I sit there and try to maximize the percentages, my return on investment, on everything. And that's not just finances. Applies the same when we're talking about diet, nutrition, about what goes into the body. I mean, let's put it this way. My phone number is 1-814-HACK-THE-PLANET. And to me, what being a hacker is, it means taking a look at a system, understanding it systematically, looking at it inside and out, looking at diet, going, all right, what can I control? What do I put into my body? How does that impact the results? And then figure out what results do I want to get and then pretty much making that system, making the world do my bidding. That's how I approach pretty much everything. But now let me tell you a little bit of a story. Let me tell you about a little younger, littler Jolly back when I was about 15 or so. And I had some significant advantages. You see, I grew up in a world with a family that was very interested in health and nutrition. My family owns two GNC stores general nutrition centers. My mom has a master's in nutrition. So I got access to a lot of cool supplements and a lot of cool knowledge that a lot of people didn't have. And I sat there and went, all right, let me think about this. I'm already smarter than most of the people around me. If I learn how to learn even faster, I can go take over the world. It was fantastic. So I started digging down into cognitive enhancement. How do I get smarter? How do I learn even faster? But then I quickly realized a lot of the things I was looking at that helped me to improve my intelligence, to enhance me there, were also things that helped stop or help battle aging. And then I went and sat and thought about it and went like, wait a minute, this old thing, this getting old, this aging thing, frankly fucking sucks. Fuck dying, fuck aging. And then I started researching that and digging down into it. And when I started doing it, 
one of the first things we started looking at was the diet side of things. And when you look into anti-aging, there's this great idea, this concept of caloric restriction. Fancy words, simply it means, well, guess what? You eat less. But the thing is, when you look at the studies, caloric restriction is the one form of life extension that's been proven to work across pretty much all mammal groups. Simply, when you end up reducing the amount of calories animals take in, they live longer. Their mean lifespan ends up increasing. And it's fantastic. It's pretty much the gold standard of longevity. And a lot of the supplements people talk about from an aging perspective end up impacting or working because they're caloric restriction mimetics. But the question is, you have to consider, what's your goals? I mean, sure, I want to live longer. But I don't want to just live longer. I don't want to grow older and be decrepit and sit there and feel <laughs> old and miserable because that would not be so much fun. And caloric restriction has some severe downsides. See, the problem with caloric restriction is a number of things. You lose your energy. You lose your internal basal temperature. You start feeling colder. You start feeling more miserable. You lose your muscle mass. You lose your sex drive. And after a certain point, you start looking and going, well, I get to live a lot longer, but I'm not sure I like the life that I end up living. And the hard thing is it's pretty hard to do. I mean, think about it. You see time and time again, hey, you've been told, I want to lose weight. So what advice do you get? Move more, exercise more, and eat less. Sounds great in concept, but in practice, it ends up being pretty hard to do. And I'm a hacker. I want things to be easy. I want the most results for the least amount of effort. So this brings us to this concept called intermittent fasting, where you get almost all of the gain for a lot less pain. And frankly, I'm pretty damn lazy. I want the most results. I want the least effort. Yes, I cheat, and I'm damn proud of it. So looking at intermittent fasting, it sounds fancy, but again, the concept at heart is really simple. Don't eat. Now, I'm not saying don't eat all the time. I mean, I can't live off of air alone. But what we end up doing is what's called restricting the feeding window. So normally, what do we do these days? We wake up in the morning, we have our bagels and fruit. A Couple hours later, we're having our breakfast or lunch. If you guys are bodybuilders, you're downing protein shakes all the time. And believe me, I work at GNC. I've owned those stores. I've sold a lot of protein and mural replacement shakes because you know you have to be eating six meals a day, eight meals a day, because if you stop eating for you know an hour and a half, you're gonna lose protein mass and muscle mass. The truth is you don't have to do all of that. We end up restricting the feeding window. Depending on who you talk to, you restrict the feeding window and fast for say anywhere between 16 and 36 hours. And depending on how long you're fasting, depends on what your goals are. Are you looking at more from a longevity standpoint like myself? Or is your goals more alongside of the, hey, I just want to look better naked? But so let's think about it. Why might this work? The thing is with our modern diets, with eating constantly, what happens is we're constantly in this growth mode. We're pretty much in an anabolic state. But the thing is, we weren't evolved in such an environment. We weren't evolved to be in a state where we're constantly eating and having those growth signals every day, pretty much throughout our waking period. We were designed to alternate this and to have states of catabolism. When your body starts repairing, breaking things down, it's basically this difference between, yes, I want to grow and build and store fat versus actually ending up burning off that fat. But let's start looking at some of the evidence for intermittent fasting. There is some pretty decent evidence out there. Predominantly, we've got a decent amount of animal studies throughout a lifespan, particularly in the mean <coughs> lifespan. And the interesting thing here is some people go that, oh, the benefits from intermittent fasting are just caloric restriction. In other words, all the benefits come from people eating less. It's not true. The study is in, uh, indicating that they get some of the benefits even if ultimately they end up eating the same amount of calories, changing that window, changing when you eat those calories, that window of time makes a huge difference. But we also have human studies. Let's think back to Madrid. The year is 1956 and you're in the best environment possible. Guess what? You're in a retirement home. Sounds fantastic. But in this case, 
like they had some smart researchers around. So they wanted to see, you know, what's some of the benefits. And they didn't even do a full, what I'd call full intermittent fasting. They did a modified study. So normally, they ended up giving all these old people 1,600 calories a day. But they changed things up a little. They switched it so you had some people were then eating 900 calories one day and 2,300 calories the next day. The study lasted for three years. And what happened? Well, in the standard group, the one that was just eating the same amount each and every day, a lot of them died. 13 of them died. They stayed an average of 219 days in the hospital. But the other group, just by changing that timing and how many calories they ate one day versus the other, only stayed in the hospital 123 days. And he had six versus 13 deaths. I had the opportunity to be at the Personalized Life Extension Conference three years ago. One of my friends, a speaker there, Patrick Friedman, was also talking about intermittent fasting. And he said, hey guys, let me ask you, what's your favorite theory of aging? Are we talking inflammation? Are we talking free radicals, insulin sensitivity? No matter what your favorite theory of aging is, intermittent fasting helps with that. And it seems true. Whether we look at the markers on inflammation, like the TNF-alpha scores, if we look at the amount of free radicals that are being created, the amount of oxidative stress, fancy terms, but simply it means pretty much when we look at the biomarkers. Skylar Tanner was talking about this yesterday. Intermittent fasting helps in all those. We look at things like, say, HDL measurements, your good cholesterol. HDL ends up improving with intermittent fasting. Look at stuff with triglycerides. Three weeks of intermittent fasting on men, the triglycerides plummeted. A lot of benefits for not that much work. Same thing when we start looking at CERT1 receptors. Let me just quote Brad Pylon. He wrote, eat, stop, eat. He says that if intermittent fasting was a pill, then seller would make a billion dollars and win a Nobel Prize. And frankly, it's just that good. So why don't we hear about it? Well, a lot of the times, let's think about it. How much money can I make selling you guys this magic, wonderful concept that guess what? You don't have to eat as often. On the other hand, if I tell you and I sell you on the story that, well, guess what? You need to be eating every couple of hours, otherwise you're going to lose muscle mass. I get to sell you all sorts of stuff. I get to sell you meal replacement powders. I get to sell you protein. I get to sell you little boxes to carry your food in in your uh, lean protein and chicken breast. And the thing is, it's not just from an anti-aging perspective, because I'll admit, that's my bias, but it's fantastic from the body composition standpoint. Intermittent fasting, particularly when you start getting the diet dialed down a little, is one of the best ways to really shred your body for that extra bit of fat loss. We heard it yesterday. Abs are not built in the gym. Abs are built in the kitchen. And it's particularly true. So let's talk a little bit about some more of the details. How do you get started? Some of the regimens. The two that I hear about the most are the Eat, Stop, Eat protocol and Martin Burkham and Lean Gains. Eat, Stop, Eat, it's pretty simple. You eat, you stop, you eat. He's usually advocating about a 24-hour period. And that doesn't mean that you wake up in the morning and don't eat all day. Rather, and I personally do this way all the time, it's basically I'll have a big dinner, wake up, not eat throughout most of the day, and then have another big dinner. That's now 24 hours of not eating. Lean gains ends up advocating more of a 16 hour fasting window and eight hours of feeding. The difference really starts being a question of what your goals are. In case your goals are predominantly like, hey, I wanna build more muscle and bulk up, I'd say more of a shorter feeding window like a lean gains protocol would work out great. If you're looking more from an anti-aging perspective, I'd advocate up to about 36 hours, so a day and a half of not eating. So how do we get started? We've heard other speakers mention diet briefly. I end up telling people, low carb paleo. Let me repeat that again. It's low carb paleo style diet. And that low carb is really important. And here's why. The thing is, if you don't end up eating low carb, let's take a look at what would happen in your body when you end up eating a meal. You eat a meal, you eat a bunch of carbohydrates, say a bunch of protein, internally in your body, your glucose starts going up. 
Ultimately, your body wants to maintain pretty tight control over glucose levels. So it ends up releasing a hormone called insulin, which starts taking this glucose, starts trying to store it. It's basically a storage and growth hormone. So it takes this glucose, assuming your muscle glycogen stores aren't depleted, you didn't just work out, and starts trying to store it. So now your insulin levels are raised. Guess what? When your insulin levels are raised, your body isn't going to be burning its natural fat reserves. It doesn't have any way to do that. So what happens? You had this meal, you had your lunch, and a couple hours later, you're looking around and all of your coworkers, their energy levels are crashing, they're miserable. Don't do it that way. This is why I end up advocating a low carb approach. When you end up eating low carb enough, your body's mostly staying in a state of ketosis. In essence, your body's burning fat for its energy, not for carbohydrates. And now it means you can go so much longer without eating because your body's using what it should be using for its energy sources. It's fat. Think about it in an ancestral environment. It'd be ludicrous to think that we needed to eat every couple hours because, you know, we've got a McDonald's in every savanna corner. That just wouldn't end up happening. And personally, I start just looking at it from this combination. I look at it from the biochem, like, okay, how, here's how it plays out on the glucose levels. I look at it from the ancestral environment, just thinking that naturally, if we think about it, we weren't involved to be eating constantly. We'd have times where when we were hungry, times when we were not. And then I just look at it as, frankly, what works. And the thing is, for me, it makes my life so much easier. I tell people that my secret superpower is I can go a day and a half without eating. And it makes my travel life just that much easier. It means I land in a city, I don't have to be rushing going, OK, I need food right now. I've got bad meal choices. Guess what? That's fine. I don't have to eat them. I wait until I've got something good to eat. People say, but that hunger's hard. Well, one, if you're eating lower carb, it makes it a lot easier. And two, the studies show that after about four weeks of starting to do intermittent fasting, your baseline hunger levels drop significantly. In other words, you get used to it. And not you get used to it because you're used to dealing with the hunger, but frankly, your hunger levels go down. Your body starts adapting because that's how it's supposed to do. It adapts to what you feed it. It adapts to the world around it. <clears throat> Same thing you hear people talking about, but I need my protein shake and my pre-workout supplement and my creatine and my beta alanine and my nitrous oxide and whatever the latest sports nutrition supplement is out there because otherwise I can't work out. Now once again, let's think about this. You're a hunter-gatherer. You're going, huh, I'm hungry. But before I go out and go kill something, I need to eat before I go out and kill something so I can eat. Let's just think about that logic, bro. Doesn't make sense. Let's now talk a little bit about some modifications. One guy I know talks about this protocol, IFOC. Simply, intermittent fasting on crap. Now, I will admit, I personally don't advocate this method. I'm a biohacker. I want the most results. I want to optimize everything. But I will say, in case you're just trying to get some easy wins, airman fasting on crap is significantly better than just eating crap. Modified intermittent fasting. We heard Dave Asprey, or he will be speaking later today. Dave, Bulletproof executive, great friend of mine. He talks about a protocol called Bulletproof Intermittent Fasting. His protocol is fairly simple. You eat dinner by 8 p.m. You wake up in the morning, you have coffee, but not just standard coffee. Take coffee, you blend a ton of butter in there, a little bit of MCT oil. MCT oil, it's medium chain triglycerides. People will say you can use coconut oil. No, use MCT oil, there's reasons behind that. Blend it. Blending is very important. And people look at me sometimes, it's crazy, I love doing this. Like, I'll work at Wall Street a lot, you'll see me a little shaker cup, making coffee, putting 14 ounces of coffee, seven tablespoons, not teaspoons, tablespoons of butter in there, a little bit of MCT oil, blending it up. People are like, you're gonna get fat. <laughs> I've got an APAC, bro. I don't think I have to worry about this. You're gonna get heart disease. I run my blood work all the time. I'm pretty sure I know what I'm doing. Blend it all up, that's about nine, a thousand calories right there. Keep going. Don't eat until 2 p.m., 
then eat for about a six hour feeding window. One of the really, really cool biohacks when you start delving down into this is, so there's this process called autophagy. It's basically when your body starts repairing and recovering. But the thing is autophagy stops when you start getting nutrients in. Because it's simple, like I don't need to scavenge my body for waste products and use those to build when I can actually just take in the food that's coming in. But the thing is, what stops autophagy for the most part seems to be carbohydrates and protein. Fat, for whatever reason, don't know why, doesn't seem to stop the process of autophagy, which means you can pretty much have your cake, or frankly, have your butter and eat it too. You can wake up in the morning, you can have fat throughout the day, get pretty much all the benefits for intermittent fasting without actually having to fast. And this particularly works great for the women out there. Because if you think about it, women, well, they were designed, in a lot of ways, they're the reproductive hosts. So they don't handle that same level of stress as men. Men, we're pretty much evolution's playthings. If we lose a lot of us, it's frankly not gonna matter all that much. So the stress ends up impacting women a lot more. So I tend to advocate shorter, or sorry, longer feeding windows, shorter fasting windows, or just simply having that fat in. Another friend of mine, Josh Wheaton, he talked at uh, the same uh, Personalized Life Extension Conference, which I highly recommend, <laughs> um, just a couple months ago. His process, is basically eating five days a week, he eats pretty low carbohydrate. Two days a week, he eats really low protein. And every day, he eats high fat. Same sort of thing, you get most of the benefits. Now personally, I tend to advocate just doing pretty much strict intermittent fasting or intermittent fasting plus fat. So a little bit more about some bonuses. I mentioned the coffee plus butter plus MCT oil. But you ask why? So here's the thing. There's this pathway called mTOR. It's mammalian target of rapamycin. And all you science and anti-aging geeks are starting to light it up in the audience. And yeah, I get fascinated by it too. But there's a couple of things that really hit that mTOR pathway. Some of the stuff we've heard about it before. Yesterday, we heard Skylar talk about, you know, lifting heavy things hits mTOR. Intermittent fasting hits mTOR. Coffee hits mTOR. So what we're talking is synergy. You get all these different things together that in the end, you get a lot more of the benefits. And why MCT oil? That medium chain triglycerides, it's basically a source of ketone bodies. Straight source, your body can't store that. It pretty much has to burn it or let it go. So what it means is your body can stay in this process of ketosis even longer, even in the process or even in the environment when you still have a little bit more carbohydrates. It's fantastic. So let me tie this all in together. Airman fasting, simply you're reducing your feeding window. So you have times when you're eating and when you're not. But it works best in conjunction with other things. I posted this on Twitter a little while ago. It's fantastic. Jolly's guide to six pack abs and 140 characters. The prescription is pretty simple. Do a low carb, and low carb is very important, paleo style diet. I'm a big fan of the Bulletproof Exec type of diet. Why you keep those carbohydrate levels low? While minimizing some of the toxins and poisons and other things that we end up eating a lot of times. Plus intermittent fasting. Pretty self-explanatory by now. Lift heavy things. And I don't mean that you go to a gym and lift those two or 10 pound dumbbells because you think you're lifting weights. I mean lift heavy things. Go deadlift, go squat, sprinting, high intensity interval training. Look at doing something like Tabitha sprints. From shredding fat loss, the Tabitha sprints, those high intensity interval trainings plus low carb plus intermittent fasting, some of the most useful protocols I've seen. For bonus points, if you're gonna do carbohydrates, eat them all in a small window, ideally right after workout, and then top it all off with that coffee plus butter and MCT oil in the morning. It's a prescription, but it's a biohacker's prescription. It's how to get the most amount of results with the least amount of effort. Any questions? Go for it. Uh, great presentation, um, speech. 
my my one question was uh about the last part as far as um when you when you work out mm -hmm. um would you still include the coffee or just the mct oil and butter so i would definitely improve the co include the coffee as i was saying part of it it's the mtor pathways and uh, what i didn't really get into is mtor i tend to care about it more from an aging perspective but also as benefits from a muscle gaining perspective Again, I do the coffee in the morning. You want that MCT oil, you want that butter. Uh, Dave might talk about it tomorrow, but butter also has some really nice aspects with the butyric acid. Uh, so definitely combine the two. And again, stimulants do end up helping significantly from a workout perspective. And I would also end up advocating creatine is probably like the most researched sports supplement out there. Uh, you don't need anything fancy. You don't necessarily need a crazy pre-workout mix, but straight creatine monohydrate, it's great from a lean body mass perspective. Hey, Jolly, killer presentation. Um, I wanted to toss you a bag of upgraded coffee as a way of saying thanks. Like but another bag to go in my <laughs> supply. There, there's something I actually wanted to point out for all of you. Did you notice the quality of his presentation? I counted ums. There were three ums. This is a guy whose brain is turned all the way on. And it's turned all the way on because he eats a high-fat diet, he uses coffee, and he uses smart drugs. And he's done other work like that as well. That's the sort of stuff you're going to hear about later today. But that was a kick-ass presentation from a guy who presents like he's maybe 10 or 15 years older than he actually is. So if, if you want to do that Toastmasters kind of thing, turn your brain on so you can think and talk at the same time like Jolly just did. That was a pretty awesome talk. I'd like to mention one thing there. So I will say one thing there. Uh, this is actually the first time I've given this presentation. I wrote it in approximately the last 30, 45 minutes when I woke up. I haven't presented at all. This was my first run through. And Dave's completely right. The reason I can do that is I've sat there and optimized every aspect of my life. Sat there and optimized the diet, optimized the nutrition, optimized the supplementation, so that way I can pretty much do whatever life throws at me. Asked to give a presentation? All right, no problem. I'm all on that. So I just had a quick question. Sure. Um, I, I have uh, an interesting problem. I fucking hate to cook. I love eating out. I eat out with friends for almost breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I have the finances to support it. So, but, and in the past, the, the, there's been a run where I ate heavy on meats, things like uh, barbecue joints mm -hmm. with no, ad, no, no additions to the, to the meat, just dry rub. Um, what are some other ideas for me about where, where can I go to get as, as, I guess, primal as possible? That's a great question, and it's something I run into all the time. As I said, I'm a nomad. I, so far this year, I've racked up probably 90,000 miles. Literally, I'm in a new city every couple of days. And there's some things you can do. Again, intermittent fasting makes it a lot easier because you don't have to be eating every couple of hours. So it's not like, okay, I've only got crappy McDonald's joints. Some other things I end up doing is I travel with a little BPA-free container of Kerrygold butter. Uh, I do Kerrygold the unsalted kind because one, Kerrygold is grass-fed, which is fantastic. Plus, the unsalted version is cultured, which ends up increasing the amount of butyric acid in there. Again, more benefits. I travel with a little uh, go tube container of MCT oil, and I pick the best options that I have possible. If you're living that lifestyle, you're traveling, you don't have the best choices, you do end up having to pick and choose. So when I'm out, I'm often asking for meat, I'm asking for fish, especially when I can find it. Uh, I didn't get into this, but from a diet aging perspective, you wanna look into your omega-3, omega-6 fatty acid ratio. Pretty much all my diets targeting towards keeping insulin and glucose levels down or keeping chronic inflammation down. Uh, so because of that, I end up eating a lot of fish, I eat larger meals, because you end up still having to get those calories in. It's just that I'm compressing the amount of time I'm eating. And you end up looking at things that make cooking a lot easier. I'll sous vide a lot of meat if I'm living in one spot. Uh, I will also end up just cooking a ton of stuff at once and then just eating it next couple of days. Uh, again, doing the bulletproof coffee thing will end up increasing because right there I'm eating a thousand calories and that's again pretty easy to travel with. And I can talk more about it offline or if you've got questions, just ping me. Did you have a question? No, sorry. I uh, just want to see if you had any <clears throat> advice for the transition period getting into intermittent fasting when you like still get the cravings and the hunger because I know when I'm really hungry I can't concentrate. Oh definitely, I mean it makes perfect sense. That's why I said I don't say just 
hey, you immediately hear my presentation, you think it's fantastic, and immediately go jump in and stop eating, because think about it, if you told your coworkers to do that, they may get pretty mad and uh, may not be so good for a stress perspective. That's why I highly advocate starting off with a low carb paleo, bulletproof executive, et cetera style diet. What you're doing is you're taking some time first to transition your body from eating what it's used to, to eating lower carbohydrate, so your body is used to using its fat sources as an energy source. Once you get that, then you can start putting in that intermittent fasting, putting in that modified intermittent fasting, because face it, you've been eating probably all of your life this way. You don't want to just change that overnight, you'll end up sliding back, you'll fe start feeling miserable. The other thing to th keep in mind is it does get better. That's why I said I've, I've looked into the research, after a couple of weeks of intermittent fasting, your hunger levels go significantly down towards your baseline. Because the thing is, most of us are not used to being hungry. Most of us, we're lucky. We live in a Western world. We can get food pretty much whenever we want it. What we call as hunger isn't hunger at all. Part of it is just frankly getting used to it, manning up. Um, just with the intermittent fasting uh, mm -hmm. protocols, do you uh, stick to one protocol or do you shift? So like some days you'll be like, I'm not on Monday, Wednesday and Friday, I don't eat breakfast. Uh, are you flexible with that or do you have a strict protocol that you follow consistently um, throughout, throughout the year? So I'm personally pretty variable with that. And a lot of it is looking at my life. Part of why I end up doing intermittent fasting and everything is to make my life easier so that way I can deal with what gets thrown at me. I work as a computer security professional, I'm a consultant, so a lot of times it's, oh, we're going out for lunch, they're paying for it, fantastic, it's Italian. Guess what, I'm not gonna eat that. So, that's great, it's a fast meal. Same thing, I'm traveling, I've got a bunch of plane rides in a row. Hey, I may be sitting in first class, they may give me some great meals, but guess what, I'm not gonna eat that, so I don't. So I tend to be personally pretty variable. If I had more of a steady static life, then yeah, I'd probably program it in a little bit better. Uh, I do end up tracking a lot of data about myself. I'm a quantified self nerd. The more data I have, the better. I've got a Zio and a Fitbit, and Dave will talk a lot more about those sorts of things that you could use if you wanted to program it in. But me personally, I'm very variable because hunter-gatherer environment. You never know what might life be throwing at you. Deal with it, adapt to it. Did we have any? <coughs> hey, uh, great presentation. Uh, one question about all the fat you're saying, the, um, the butter intake. Mm -hmm. now, now, I know you were talking about research, um, but I kind of wanted to ask, the research was over what period of time with regards to the, to the health and, um, and to your uh, blood health and whatnot, because I would assume... Are you it, asking for me personally or the studies that I've seen out there? Or, or studies you've seen. And the reason I'm asking is like, you know, you could be taking a lot of fat and you might not see the, uh, you might not see the blockage to your arteries or whatever over a short amount of time. <laughs> but, you know, what, what happens over the long run? Has there so, been any research? I'll admit, there's not that many studies out there in scientific published research, and I'm caveating that pretty closely. Uh, for intermittent fasting. The studies that we see are far more on things like caloric restriction, but what we indicate is, and this is why I said that IFOC is it doesn't really matter what you're eating from that perspective, as long as you're doing that intermittent fasting and the caloric restriction. I can say I've tracked my own data a number of years, and this is now getting away from the intermittent fasting component and the diet and nutrition component of it. And looking at it, doing things like a low carb paleo, particularly when you're combining that plus lifting heavy stuff, what you see is your HDL numbers skyrocket, your triglycerides end up plummeting, and it seems to have pretty positive impacts. Like things like, so I track what's called a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. It's a measure of inflammation. Mine last time I checked was too low to be measured. That's with the crazy diet and stuff that I end up eating. There's an infographic, a infographic on bulletproofexec.com that talks about butter research like that. But the best research of all is the human race. Our brains are built out of fat. We evolved to eat fat. And all the historical societies eat the fat first. You kill a buffalo, you whack the fat off the top of the bat, and the biggest, baddest guy, the chief, gets to eat it first, and then the liver. And that's how it works. 
So the idea that somehow we're supposed to not do that, and he was giving himself heart disease, isn't borne out because people who eat more fat tend to be higher performer, they reproduce better. And the whole ancestral health movement shows us that eating more fat makes you healthier, not unhealthy, as long as it's naturally occurring healthy fat, not this canola synthetic junk. It's really fascinating if you're asking that question to dig into the history of why we believe fat is bad for us. And this is a really modern view. We've only had this since about the 1930s, 1940s. You had Ansel Keys. And basically with that, we started getting this whole fat phobia. Before that, it was well known that, hey, in case you wanted to put on a lot of fat, you'd feed the same thing we feed cattle. You'd give them a lot of grains, a lot of carbohydrates. But if you wanted to lose weight, there's tons of basically meat diets at that time where you ate meat, you lost fat, you gained muscle mass. Um, and there's some couple good books about it. Uh, Gary Chobbs has a book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. It's a, literally like a tomb of information. It's one of the few books in my life I've ever taken notes on. If you're fascinated between the biochemistry and the history of it, he's a former writer for science, goes into great detail. He has another book that's a little bit more accessible to the masses about the history entitled Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. And again, ping me. I've got a whole bunch of links. You can find me on Twitter. I'm Jolly on Twitter. Uh, my website's A Jolly Life, and I don't publish quite enough things on there. Do we have time for more questions? Or? No, we got to wrap it up. OK, wrapping it up, uh, again, I'd like to give some thanks to my Dave Asprey, Bulletproof Executive. Dave's got pretty much all the same information same sort of things that I think about. Josh Whedon, again, the Whedon Protocol. Patrick Friedman, he spoke at the Personalized Life Extension Conference. Also, Martin Birkin, Lean Gains, he's popularized intermittent fasting, particularly among the bodybuilder set more than anyone else. And also, the IF Life is pretty good. And I think uh, John Bacardi just published a really good PDF on this, but I haven't had time to read it. Uh, so. Go check out those resources, or again, ping me if you've got any questions, and I'll be around for the rest of the day. What's your website? ajollylife.com. A-J. The letter A, okay. jolly, J-O-L-L-Y, life, L-I-F-E, dot com. Because you know, life's a lot better when you're having fun. <laughs>